haven't met before. Uh, I'm Penny Donkar. I'm the director of the Domestic Violence and Sexual Advocacy Project. Uh, thank you all for coming today for our discussion for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, we're really lucky today to have three very knowledgeable um, people in the North Carolina legal system dealing with issues of domestic violence. We have Sebastian Kilmanovich, who now works for the District Attorney's Office in Wilmington. He's a 2004 graduate of Duke Law School. Um, previously was working in Buenos Aires doing legal work and um, now um, is working in North Carolina. We also have Tiandra Miller and Suzanne Chester, um, both of Legal Aid of North Carolina. Uh, Tiandra is the director of the Battered Immigrants Project, um, dealing with some of the, the issues that immigrants deal with in domestic violence uh, situations. And um, Suzanne Chester is the managing partner of the the domestic violence unit <laughs> <laughs> of, of legal aid in North Carolina. Um, so we're going to each have them kind of talk about today some of the issues faced um, by survivors of domestic violence when dealing with the legal system and perhaps solutions to these problems and then open up the floor for questions if you guys have any. Uh, thank you again for coming. All right, guys. Uh, as Penny said, my name is Sebastian, and um, I graduated from this law school in 2004. Uh, before that, um, I used to practice law in Argentina, and I came originally for the LLM program. Uh, I loved it, and I said I want to get the JD, and I stayed, and, uh, and I worked for a short period of time for Legal Aid of North Carolina doing some domestic violence work. Um, then I realized that I wanted to continue doing the same, but from the criminal side. So today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the civil and the criminal side of domestic violence. And domestic violence is a very complicated and, and big topic. So I'm going to try to move fast, but I think that it's important to get a few things clear. Now, I want you to keep this interactive because uh, I want you to know what you think about domestic violence. And I want to ask you, first of all, what do you think is the difference between domestic violence uh, and just plain violence? Who can tell me uh, what, what's the difference between, what, what it would be one difference between one and the other? Yes? Domestic violence happens within a family. Okay. Just a family? Anybody else can give another example of uh, domestic violence? It has to be a family. It has to be a legal relationship. Come on. Let's keep this interactive. Can, could it be uh, Yes, Penny? I'd say any kind of intimate, intimate relationship. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a broad family contact. Gotcha. Your significant other, your spouse, okay. relative. All right. So good. So we see how it, it, it gets bigger. It's, uh, it's the relationship uh, that uh, two people may have, and uh, it could be a legal relationship just like marriage, it could be dating, it could be uh, uh, they may have had a child in common, but now they're not together anymore, but there's still some interaction between the two of them. Now, before we get into this uh, commercial, I want to show you, uh, do you think that uh, people from the same sex uh, should be covered in domestic violence? Okay. All right, the law as it is right now in North Carolina doesn't cover that. And we'll see in just a moment that it has to be people from the opposite sex. Now, that may change, but right now that's what the legislature said it is. Let's watch this and let's see what you think about it. Let's see if it works, first of all. Okay. <laughs> Doing a real good job on your Can picture. Coffee? Please. I'd like some more too, please, sir. She spilled my coffee. I'm sorry, sir. You fucking bitch. <laughs> I think it shows the point that we're going to see in just a moment, which is what happens when we have to do something about domestic violence. What are the issues that we face? It's pretty shocking, huh? 
what is domestic violence? We discussed some of the things, uh, and, and it's just common sense. Uh, we talked about people that are married, that are divorced, uh, people opposite sex, have a child in common, a parent and a child, a friend, parent. This is what the law requires you to check to qualify for one order of, of protection for domestic violence. Um, and as we said, it doesn't cover right now people from the same sex. Now, two different main things we're going to talk about. I'm going to move very quick. Legal aspects of domestic violence and the real issues. There are two different things. Now, we can talk about the propaganda about domestic violence, but I, I want to talk to you about the real problems that we have about domestic violence. Now, what do we see? How does the process start? The process start obviously when there is an emergency situation and someone calls 911. Uh, somebody's hitting me, my husband is hitting me, or my boyfriend is, uh, is assaulting me. That's how we start with the criminal and civil consequences. Another option, the victim goes to the magistrate's office. In North Carolina, we have a magistrate's office. You can go, put your hand on the Bible and say, this person, my boyfriend, my husband hit me. And if the magistrate finds that there's probable cause to believe the person has committed a crime, then somebody will be charged, and that person is the perpetrator. And how do you get an order of protection for domestic violence? You go to the clerk's office of the county in which the action took place. Now, we see now there are two different paths, paths that uh, domestic violence can take. One is the civil, and the, the other one is the criminal. This is probably the most confusing thing think for uh, domestic violence victims. Uh, why? Because it, sometimes it's, different, it's difficult to differentiate what's the difference between the civil and the criminal. Hopefully this will clarify it. Civil, you get a plaintiff versus a defendant. The plaintiff, as maybe some remember from other classes, who is the plaintiff in a case? It's the master of the process. The master of the process can dismiss the case at any time. It's the same that you sue somebody that ran into you with a car. If you don't want to pursue the action after it has been initiated, you can dismiss the case. Therefore, in a civil case, a victim of domestic violence for a protective order can change her mind. And I will let you think about it, what are the reasons why she may want to change her mind or she's being pressed to change her mind. Think about that. Two type of orders, one is uh, temporary, the other one is a permanent order. Permanent, anyway, is no more than one year. It could be extended. The temporary is called ex parte. Who can tell me what ex parte means? Exactly. In an emergency situation, the victim wants to go and tell the judge, he's, he's assaulting me, I'm afraid for my safety, but if we let the defendant the abuser know about this situation, may put the victim in a more dangerous situation. So the law allows the victim to get this temporary protective order, which later will have to be a trial in which the judge will decide whether he's going to extend it for a, a one year term. Now we have the criminal, which is the state versus the defendant. What's the difference, what's the main difference here is that the victim can't dismiss the case. The state has to dismiss the case. So even if the victim comes and says, it just didn't happen, uh, I changed my mind, um, the officer uh, was not seeing or appreciating things the way that happened, um, still the state has to make the decision to dismiss the case. Now, think about the difference. What's the interest of the state? The interest of the state is to stop violence, to stop crime. and that's what the state will have in mind at the time of making a decision. And what are the crimes that mainly fall in domestic violence? Domestic violence protective order violation, assault on a female, communicating threats, stalking, among others. What do you need to get a domestic violence protective order? This is what the, you need to check in the form. It says, the defendant has attempted to cause or has intentionally caused me bodily injury or has placed me or a member of my family or household in fear of imminent, imminent serious bodily injury or in fear of continued, continued harassment that rises to such a level as to inflict substantial emotional distress or has committed a sexual offense against me. Then you need to explain. So you see what the judge will be looking for in order to grant that protective order. We talked a little bit about the ex parte. 
just for a period of time, 10 days generally, and then there's a hearing. The Constitution kicks in. You cannot impose an injunction in, against somebody because that's what it is. The domestic violence order will say, defendant, you can't get close, you can not contact, you can't go to the place of employment, you may not go to the place where the children go to school. That's an injunction. It's saying to a person, you cannot do it. Now, the Constitution requires that the person is given an opportunity to be heard. So that's why the hearing has to take place in which the defendant is present. The ex parte is only limited for a period of time. And the judge will decide that permanent is one year. It could be extended. And we see the plaintiff versus defendant. The plaintiff for the victim can dismiss the case at any time. Criminal. Now, we're switched to the criminal side, and we see the other side of the same coin. If you get a domestic violence protective order, and the defendant, the abuser, violates the order. And you tell me what, what examples you think that they will fall within a violation of an order. It's just common sense. Continued contact. All right, contact. What type of contact? Direct? Maybe indirect Telephone also. What if the abuser tells a friend, hey, give her a call, tell her that I want to send her flowers. Would that qualify as contact under the protective order? Yes, it would be violating the spirit. So it would be direct, indirect contact. Maybe going to the children's place of education and trying to get to meet the female there when she's picking up the kids or trying to engage in any type of action that a reasonable person will realize that it's going to create some contact in violation of the order. So now, I have a question. Sure. Now, how seriously does the criminal justice system take it when the violation consists of him sending her flowers, for example? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, obviously, the, the flowers by itself is less serious than if there's an assault that, that occurred, and that would be a violation of the order also. Well, the decision is made as to the seriousness also, taking into consideration what's the history behind the relationship. If he, by sending flowers, you know, is trying to convey a message, it's not just an innocent, you know, packet of flowers. He used to send flowers every time before he, you know, beat her up. So, you know, that flower is placing her in, in, in fear of for her safety. Or uh, I think it's a matter of talking to the victim and saying, what's the, you know, what's the impact that that conduct had on her? and then making the determination. No matter what, a violation is a violation. So perhaps um, the consequences should change at the time of punishment, but uh, it should be taken seriously because this defendant is showing uh, a lack of respect for a court order, which later can escalate into a more complicated situation. It may be testing the waters, in other words. So you need to uh, pursue them all but make a determination based on the circumstances. And please, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I, I want this to be as much interactive as possible. Um, then we have legal issues that are related to this uh, in addition, and those are related in a criminal side with a confrontation clause. Um, there is somebody from this law school, I don't know, it may be even present in this room. Her name is Lindsay McGuire. Uh, and maybe you, many of you know her. I know that she's a 3L. Well, she wrote, wrote a memo for the American Prosecutors Institute about uh, domestic violence prosecution. And basically, she discussed all of these three cases. Why are these three cases important? Because these cases have put a very um, very strong um, obstacle in the prosecution of domestic violence. Let me give you this example. Let's say that um, the male, the abuser, uh, beats the female and she calls 911 and she says, uh, he's beating me up, um, I have blood all over my face, he just threw, threw me uh, in broken glass and the police comes uh, the police takes the report, um, and then the case is set for trial. The victim never shows up. The question is, 
Should those statements made to the 911 operator be admissible in the case against this defendant? What do you think? She never shows up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, for, I guess you're referring to the excited utterance exception. Okay. Maybe some of you remember some rules of evidence. Uh, generally, a statement that is used, is used for the truth of the matter asserted cannot be used in court. Um, unless it qualifies under some exceptions to the hearsay rule. Present sense impression, excited utterance, business records exceptions. There are many different exceptions to the hearsay rule. Well, Crawford versus Washington, the Supreme Court said, um, regardless of whether you can think of it as an excited utterance, you need to remember the confrontation clause that people have the right to confront their accusers. And not because it falls within a rule of evidence is necessarily admissible in trial. It may, be still, may still be a violation of the Confrontation Clause. In other words, the Constitution comes first and the rules of evidence later. The question is whether the statement is testimonial in nature. And what the Supreme Court was saying is that we don't want people to make statements that are intended to be used later in trial. Uh, and, be, and use the excited utterance exception and then present it in case without the possibility of confrontation. Well, this case came first, then these two illustrate the situation. A case like that with a 911 call in which the victim is saying to the operator, this is what's happening, is admissible. But if the victim says, this is what just happened, is not. That's what it comes down to. What's happening versus what happened. If it's what's happening, there's a good chance it's coming in because it's the victim is relating to the police uh, dispatcher the circumstances for purposes of seeking aid because it's an emergency. But if the victim is saying, what happened is that he uh, beat me up and then he threw me to the, uh, to the broken glass, is different. That's what the Supreme Court says. So this puts uh, a burden in the prosecution of domestic violence because it's becoming difficult to realize which one it is. And you know how the Supreme Court is. They don't decide cases. They don't decide issues if there's no case. So sometimes they say in Crawford, they said that statements that are testimonial don't come in. Statements that are non-testimonial come in. And they say, what is testimonial, we'll leave it for a different day. So they were waiting for another case to come, and they knew, I'm sure, that these were coming. And then they made, they clarify what is testimonial. So that just show you that there are a lot of obstacles on the way. Now, but this is also what creates the, the majority of the problem in the prosecution. <sighs> Victims don't come to court. You tell me why. Why do you think they don't come to court? They're afraid. They're afraid. What else? Afraid of what? Their abuse. Okay. Um, and within that category, what do you think the abuser can do to the victim? Threaten, intimidate, um, lock her up to stay in the house, in a room, uh, you, you use your imagination. Probably everything happens. So, and sometimes they don't come to court because they may think that even if they come and, and even if the case is prosecuted and the person is convicted, maybe that's going to place the victim in a more dangerous situation. That also could be a reason. They fail to tell what happened. Do you think that sometimes they want to protect the abuser? They do. They want to protect. And they want to protect also because of the, maybe the same reasons, because they're intimidated, they're scared. Penny, you want to say something? I was going to say also the psychological dynamics of domestic violence. A lot of times the victim will blame themselves. And so what an outsider prosecutor may look at and think is something that's completely out of their control, not Mm -hmm. something that they caused, the victim may feel as though it was something that they caused. 
right. bottle themselves. Domestic violence is not about anger, it's about power and control. So what we have here is a situation that is being uh, escalating, that is, that is you know, um, transiting a time frame in which the victim starts to lose perspective as to what's going on. And then things start to become normal that maybe for somebody that you know you, you you expose for the first time and that's your instinct you know when you when you're with somebody and you know that something is not right you know you know that feeling there's something that's not right well that's what you got to follow now if you don't follow that and then you get into something that perhaps you know especially if you're with a person that is uh, manipulative or you know there's some type of uh, psychological issues tough to come back you know to to zero and, and be able to see everything in perspective. <coughs> cases get dismissed or cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you know that what's a standard in a criminal case, right? That's, you know, what we know, things that need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, you can prove beyond a preponderance of the evidence. If you have to say a percentage, you would just say preponderance of the evidence, well, probably more than 50% chance that, you know, that something happened. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt, more than 95 chances that something happened. So the judge will, or the jury is going to be looking for, it's going to be looking to be fully convinced and satisfied that something happened. So if you don't have the victim coming, or you don't have the victim telling the truth as to what happened, now think whether you can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt, and you know as you stay right there, that what she said at the beginning to the police officer was probably the truth as to what happened. Because it just happened and because she was interviewed and she stated the facts. But now it's not admissible because it was testimonial. Because she didn't call 911. Or she called and she just hung up and then the police came. There was no um, uh, a what's happening situation. All right, this is when it gets good. Is this a woman's issue or, or is a man's issue? I want you to tell me what you think. Is, yeah. is domestic violence a problem for <clears throat> a woman? It's starting to show up with same-sex couples, so in that example, it can very much be a man's issue. You know, when one's, you know, in a male couple where one man is abusing the other. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'd say even if you aren't looking at who the victim of the abuse is, it still can be a man's issue if you look at perhaps uh, the, the, I guess the correlation between childhood abuse of someone turning into, you know, becoming a batterer themselves. So if you look at it that sense um, as a man's issue, just as perhaps child abuse turning into battering, it's still a man's issue depending on how you look at it, whether from either perspective. Okay, so we, we know that there are cases that involve uh, females abusing males. There are, uh, but you know, most of the time what I see in court is the opposite, is men abusing uh, women. Now, um, then I think that what Penny was saying is very interesting, because if most of the time we see cases of men abusing women, then um, who is committing the action? Uh, and if it's the men, then it has to be an issue for the men, because um, that's a perpetrator and that's who uh, is going to be held accountable, and that's the one who is committing these acts. So I think it has to do with, uh, with the education, the role models, and what people see happening in our society. Let's see this, this video. By the way, this YouTube, you find anything. It used to be about someone being jumped from behind and forcing some innocent person from behind. Enforcing some innocent person. Now, stranger rape is the most uncommon. Stranger rape is the most uncommon. There are stranger rapes. There are stranger rapes. 85% of the women are stranger raped. Overwhelming majority. 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 Uh, people who know each other, uh, either through groups or school, universities. We forget about um, when dealing with this issue, um, 
where this came from, mm -hmm. women's rights. And there's a background that goes to this. It goes back years and years. You have to be sensitive. You have to understand what the history is and try to convey that to younger men. One of It used to be. It used to be about someone being jumped from behind and forcing some innocent person. Now, stranger rape is is the most uncommon. There are stranger rapes, but the overwhelming majority, eighty five percent or more, are acquaintance rapes. They don't talk about what's happening day to day in our community, and it's well, underreported. It's much easier to talk about that really wild rape that happened from a stranger in an alley. But then you have. The whole dating, adolescent, going into college, yeah. acquaintance rape, uh, people who know each other uh, either through groups or school, universities. We forget about, um, when dealing with this issue, um, where this came from, mm -hmm. women's rights. And there's a background that goes to this. It goes back years and years. You have to be sensitive. You have to understand what the history is and try to convey that to younger men. One of the reasons that men don't stay historically is that we haven't succeeded in helping men to see that this is an issue that affects our lives. Men haven't been involved. We can be empowered by encompassing men in the rape crisis movement. I think that every rape crisis center wants men to be involved. I see that young men are eager and willing and ready to step up to the plate and say, you know what? I want to change this. We're ready to go. What we need to do is, is open those doors and have them walk through and give them the tools to be able to make that happen and be successful to prevent this and to end it. I just think that in our society, every once in a while, somebody gets enlightened. Mm -hmm. And then they take it and run with it. And then they get funding for it. And I'm happy to be on that bandwagon. I think this has been needed for a long time. I think we're all hungry to want to get young men involved in the work that we're doing and have them go out and teach other, teach their peers about, about it. About uh, rape mainly, but you think that it's very different from, uh, from the, the problem here is sometimes it's connected. It's, uh, we call it domestic violence, but it's dating violence or it's any type of violence that involves people of different sexes. So uh, I, th I thought that was interesting because it shows uh, how men uh, have something to do with the problem and how combined is uh, sexual abuse with domestic violence. Um, I don't know if we have, until what time do we have here? Um, we have until about 1.25, so probably soon. Okay, okay. Let's, um, let's watch just one more that I think you will like, or at least you will find interesting. Tim, five. Certainly, darling. Look what you did. What? You spilled. I'm sorry. It's, it's just a little bit. Here you go again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what can I do? You can't do anything because you can't do anything right. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Just shut up. Say it with a dance in your interesting to show that whatever happens uh, it doesn't end up in, in especially if there are kids around it will continue and you will see it coming again because that's what they learn as normal um, and I, I'm going to let Andrew and Susan continue now uh, I had more but uh, if only if there's time we can we can talk about those Do I need to turn this on? Do I sound any different? <laughs> well, maybe you can just hear my regular voice. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, a, couple, a couple of comments about the barriers that victims face in the civil court system. Um, I work at the Rally Office of Legal Aid, and I supervise the domestic violence unit there. 
and we work primarily in the civil court system. We do a little bit of advocacy in the criminal justice system, but mainly we represent victims of domestic violence who are looking for protective orders in civil court. We also represent these same people in custody proceedings, and so they're the two main areas that I'll talk to you about some of the obstacles that these people face. Well, um, first of all, getting an attorney is the, is the big obstacle. Uh, there was a study done by the University of Colgate University, the, the Univers Colgate University about three years ago, and it found that of all the services available to victims of domestic violence, the one that made the most difference was if a victim of domestic violence was able to access an attorney to represent her in obtaining civil legal services. And so they found that that was more effective in terms of reducing the incidence of domestic violence in the following years than any other service. So as a result, that has been very good for people working in the areas of civil domestic violence because more money has been put into grants to make attorneys available. Unfortunately, we're still far from meeting you know, the, the overall the total need. One thing that happens is frequently a victim goes and gets an ex parte order from court. And when she goes, it's just the judge and herself and maybe the bailiff, and there might not be anybody else in the courtroom or just people sitting there not really listening. It's a very non-adversarial -adver context. She goes and she tells the judge what happened, and the judge writes it down, and typically a judge will grant the ex parte order. And it's all, relatively speaking, it's fairly easy for the victim to do that, to actually speak with the judge. The abuser isn't there, the defense attorney isn't there. It's, it's non-adversarial to a large extent. So frequently the victim gets lulled into a false sense of security. Oh, well, I have to go back in 10 days' time. You know, everybody's been very nice to me so far. They may think that when I, I know that this does happen, that when they go back in 10 days' time, things are going to be pretty much the same. Unfortunately, 10 days later, things are usually very, very different. One, she's lived with the fact for the last 10 days that she's gotten a domestic violence protective order against her husband or her boyfriend. Her family may be upset with her. His family may be upset with her. She's feeling the financial pressure. She's got three children. He was the primary source of income. Um, she's got all of those psychological pressures on her and financial pressures on her. Then when she gets to court and she discovers that he's represented by an attorney, that is, you can imagine how devastating that is. Not only is she facing her abuser in court for the first time, but now she's also facing her abuser's attorney in court. Um, and she's there without an attorney. So therefore, we train, we talk with our domestic violence shelters that we work with, and we really encourage them to have victims of domestic violence ask for an attorney through legal aid before they go to these proceedings. Because almost, I mean, you can say with almost near certainty that she will do better with an attorney than without. That's not to say that a lot of people cannot represent themselves on a pro se basis. If the defendant is pro se and the victim is pro se, then, I mean, you have, it's not an equal playing field because she's still dealing you know, with her abuser, but certainly she has a better chance of success in that situation than if she's up against opposing counsel. Um, and because judges, you know, they like to see cases settle. So when an attorney shows up on one side or the other, the judge is saying, can you all, you know, is there, is there some way of settling this? Take, you know, take a few minutes to talk with Miss so-and-so, see, see if you can reach a resolution. And so that means the victim may be you know, in a room with opposing counsel trying to work on a settlement. Now, she doesn't know the legal implications of domestic violence protective order. She doesn't know that unless it's on specific forms, then it's not going to be enforceable by law enforcement. So in cases like that where she is unrepresented and the defendant is represented, she can end up sign agreeing to things which really aren't in her best interest at all. Another barrier that, our, that victims of domestic violence face a lot in the civil court system, and it's kind of in tandem with the criminal court system, is the amount of time they have to spend in court can get to be really forbidding. 
Frequently, there are underlying criminal charges which are working their way, and in Wake County, criminal cases get continued at least twice in my experience, sometimes more than that, which means a victim may be showing up in criminal court two to four times before the case is resolved. She's also having to go to a separate courtroom on a separate day to get her 50B domestic violence protective order. Um, fortunately, we in, in Wake County, and I'm talking specifically about Wake, we now have new local rules, which means that continuances are really frowned upon. A continuance is really only granted in cases where the defendant uh, you know, wants to get an attorney. Uh, and so w once he's been given one continuance to get an attorney, it's very unlikely he's going to get another continuance. So fortunately, our local rules now have tried to cut down on the number of continuances granted because that is a huge deterrent to victims of domestic violence staying the course in terms of getting a protective order if they have to repeatedly come back to court and they keep missing time you know, from work or having to make alternative childcare arrangements, whatever it is. Financial issues are one that we try to really focus on at the 50B hearing. Usually the woman has not been the primary um, source of income for the family in the cases that we deal with. More often than not, than not the father of the children has been. Therefore, when she makes the decision to get a domestic violence protective order, she is making a huge decision in financial terms. I mean, she has basically decided to, you know, to fly solo, even though she may not even be working. And she's going to be dependent on the court system to get her a child support order as, as soon as possible. Um, the child support enforcement agencies will help her to get a child support order, but typically it takes between three to six months. Therefore, when we go with her to get a domestic violence protective order in civil court, we're really pushing to get her temporary custody of the children and to get her emergency child support. Because that obviously is a huge gap of time, three to six months, where she's without any income from the father in supporting the children. And it's a very real reason why many women never leave their abusers to begin with because they're afraid from a financial position and why they return to them afterwards because they just can't manage financially. Any questions about um, those specific barriers or any other barriers that have occurred to you as we've been talking about the civil and the criminal process? In North Carolina, legal aid doesn't require financial um, criteria to for the DV section, correct? Like it, exactly. That's the only client that we don't that doesn't have to meet a certain level of income. We can represent somebody regardless of their income. Uh, in fact, it's one of the requirements of the federal grant that we don't eliminate people just because they're earning more than our other legal aid clients. Is it, so that's nationwide. That's not just in North Carolina. That's my understanding, and Tiandra will be in a better position to to address that she's our project director and so she's more familiar with the grants. I, I cannot say it's throughout um, the country. It depends what type of grant you get from the federal government. We get a Victim of Crime Act and, for the, and those are called VOCA grants and those grants require for us to take any victim of domestic violence. Yes. Is the idea? Oh. Is the idea behind that because the victim may not have access to you know, the assets, you know, maybe her husband's earning that money, she never sees the checkbook, you know, that kind of a thing? Yes, you sound like a funder. Yes, that, that's <laughs> perfect. That is the reason. And because the short turnaround time, I mean, by the time they file the petition, we're back in court in 10 days. So, I mean, it's not a lot of time, um, sometimes for folks even get their hands on the assets, if they even have that ability. So, and also, uh, representation in family law matters, both domestic violence and any kind of custody proceeding, is phenomenally expensive. I think maybe there was also an understanding on the part of the funders that uh, the vast majority of victims of domestic violence wouldn't be able to hire a private attorney. You know, the prices range for a 50B proceeding in Wake County anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000. And I mean, that's a huge amount of money, obviously, to come up with. You had a question? Yeah, do you ever consider the federal income tax consequences to facing the abused uh, victim and trying to get planning through your orders 
you take care of the federal tax issues? Um, occasionally we do, and we're looking at that issue now more and more. Um, Tiandra, I think, to her. <laughs> and I have a meeting Friday to discuss that issue with our um, low income tax um, credit group to see how we can look at some of those issues, the, the tax consequences. I can tell you, I'm not extremely familiar with all those consequences, but we do have a group um, in our Greenville area. There's a, a low income tax project in our low, Greenville. Low income tax. Yes, so they're going to, we're meeting Friday to see how we can look at both of these issues. And Are you aware that there's a low income tax clinic here at Duke? I think I Absolutely. am aware of that. <laughs> Are you part of that? <laughs> Would you like to? Well, maybe you come with this project. I mean, your Greenville people usually refer cases to me, so I'm, I'm well, not right. sure. We're, it, this is an in-house meeting. Yes. I'm talking with other, the legal aid folks there, so they probably well, There's did. tremendous ramifications in early tax planning. If you were able to do that in your, where you're doing a custody order and you're getting child support set up, if there's income tax issues, there would be a tremendous benefit to your uh, client if you can work in the uh, federal income tax consequences and it'll eliminate a lot of problems going down there. I'd like to talk with you about yeah. in more detail about Please. some of the things. Typically in the child support order we will have provisions about, or sometimes anyway, um, we'll have provisions about who can claim the children as a deduction. That would be the typical issue that does get addressed. Beyond that, in, a, in your typical child support order you're not going to deal with a lot of tax Unfortunately, issues. Unfortunately there's a lot of already income tax that due from the husband and the wife and the, if the husband doesn't pay for whatever reasons IRS seems to center in and, and try to collect from the woman and then you can they can actually offset the child support against the outstanding income tax liabilities so there's okay. a lot of things that you need to think about. Now one thing that you have to be very careful about in domestic violence court is if the judge thinks your client is in there to address either property issues or financial issues or custody issues, then you're, you're creating a huge disadvantage for yourself from the beginning. So my advice to my clients is if the case is not like very strong, then we put everything else on the back burner. Because first of all, in Wake County, we now have bifurcated proceedings. The trial is split up into two phases. The first phase is to determine has domestic violence occurred. The second phase is to determine whether or not the victim or the defendant should be granted custody of the children and whether any child support should be awarded. So we don't even get to talk about custody or child support until the judge has determined that domestic violence has occurred. Um, one point that Sebastian was making that I wanted to follow up, and in Wake County anyway, um, if you look at the 50B statute, it says that members of the same household are entitled to get a domestic violence protective order. So fortunately, uh, people in same-sex relationships can fall into this provision. We're quite sure that the North Carolina legislature never intended it that way, <laughs> but the plain language of the statute allows members of the same sex, if they have lived together, to get one. And we see that happen in Wake County all of the time. I'm not sure how it plays out in other counties across the state. Tiandra, have you heard? It's pretty well, consistent. It's pretty consistent, okay. Um, children is another area that I wanted to talk about how the fact of having children can become a huge obstacle as well as an impetus to getting a protective order. Many of the clients we deal with have been advised by Child Protective Services to get domestic violence protective orders. And they're warned, you know, if you keep allowing your children to be exposed to this domestic violence, even though the father is the perpetrator, then we may have to step in and do something. So frequently when they first file it is because they have been warned. Sometimes Sometimes it's very difficult for women to deal with these protective issues relating to their children because it could be that there's been highly inappropriate discipline against the children. The dad has been hitting the kids so hard, causing bruises, which would amount to domestic violence under North Carolina law, but the mother was there and may not have taken any affirmative action at that time. And it's very difficult for her three months later to have to testify about that, you know, 
basically admitting that she didn't do anything back at that time. But the main thing that we really focus on is, well, now you're doing something, you are getting the children out of that situation. And Child Protective Services, you know, typically understands that it does take a certain amount of time to leave. Um, Another, another way that children can serve as a barrier to people getting protective orders is they know the children love the father and they're afraid that a protective order means he may not be able to see the children for a year. I mean, a lot of victims really don't have the sense that you can actually tailor these orders to your particular needs. Of course he can see the children while the protective order is in effect. It just needs to be made very clear in the order when he's going to get visitation with them, what his access is going to be. But by no means does it mean that he's not going to see them for that year, unless the domestic violence against the children specifically was so severe that a judge orders that. That would, be, that would be a very unusual circumstance. I don't want to take up any more time here, but any more questions regarding children in these and how they, f how they play into barriers for victims? Just in terms of percentages, would you say 95% of your clients have children? I'd or say about 80% of uh -huh. them have children, yeah. Um, and many of them, usually when they have children, it's more, it's, typically it's more than one, maybe two or three would be kind of a typical victim that we would deal with. We have a lot of single women as well, or married women who don't have children, but probably about 80%, I would say. What about immigrants? Do you get a lot of, do you deal with a lot of visa issues or issues where, you know, the, the wife isn't a citizen, but the husband has the green card, or, you know what I mean? Chiandra heads up the Battered Immigrant Project, so I'm going to let her talk about that right away. It's the perfect timing. <laughs> and yes, we have cases like that, which she'll talk to you about. Now. I will say, in the interest of time, I will not speak a lot about battered immigrant um, issues, just because it's very complicated. However, I did bring out, I brought some brochures in English and Spanish and some handouts. So if you guys can take those on your way out and if anyone had any follow-up questions or issues I also have a few cards but we can be reached by our website www.legalaidnc.org and that's all of our contact information it also has pretty extensive information about our project I am the project director actually for the domestic violence prevention initiative which is our statewide uh, program um, where we have placed attorneys throughout all of our field offices and as Suzanne has mentioned, she's in our Raleigh office. I sit in the Raleigh office, so I'm always picking on Suzanne or someone from the Raleigh office to assist me. I also head up our Battered Immigrants Project. Um, and what's interesting about that project, recently I've begun to carry a caseload of battered immigrant um, cases. And that's just because of the need. We actually, before I joined, we had really two attorneys covering the state. We had one attorney in our, she was in Greenville, but now she's in the uh, Raleigh office. We have an attorney in the Charlotte office, and we also have, how many? About three support staff people. And as you can see, for a project to have like two attorneys and three support, it really did not meet the need. And so I've thrown my hat in the ring and we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm kind of just part-time because I run the other projects. But I wanted to say in terms of battered immigrant issues, um, I thought you brought up a good point. If you heard what the two have just said about domestic violence, add into the mix that the person is an immigrant. I mean, it just escalates all of those issues. Oftentimes we have women here who are married to U.S. citizens or legal permanent residence and another word for that well you might know of someone having a green card and by the way they're not even green but um, if a person is married to a US and I'll say USC or LPR um, if domestic violence occurs they can move for self petition and what that means they can petition directly to the government for their citizenship and that's what our BIP project assists them with. And I wanted to name some of the criteria. 
um, for us to assist a person with self-petitioning, first they would have to be married to a USC or an LPR, or if they were divorced, it would have had to be within two years. The person would have to show that they married in good faith and not for immigration purposes. So, um, I told my Eve, that's um, a lot more difficult than I initially thought. I mean, some of the, a lot of the marriages are, um, some are arranged through services or a lot of people meet on the internet. That is not a bar for a bona fide marriage, but a good faith marriage, you would have to show that, you know, subsequent to the marriage, that the, the folks actually lived as a married couple. Um, you would have to show that the folks had lived together for some period of time and that there was physical abuse or extreme emotion, emotional cruelty by the spouse. Also, um, if you have someone here on a fiancé visa, um, we can help them remove those conditions um, and it's a similar criteria. They would have had to show a good faith marriage and also that there was physical or emotional abuse. Um, however, especially in this part of the world or in North Carolina, we have a lot of um, folks who are undocumented. Um, and a lot of people that were in abusive relationships really had no relief until the introduction of what's called a U visa. Now the U visa is for folks who are victims of crime. It doesn't matter if you're married to the person or not. It doesn't matter if um, you're in a relationship. If you are a victim of crime, and you cooperate with law enforcement, you are eligible to pursue a U visa. The only problem is that you would have to get someone in law enforcement. It could be a district attorney or someone in the, the sheriff's department or police department to certify that you cooperated with the prosecution of the criminal. And you know, we thought, oh, this is great. But what we find difficult sometimes throughout the state, I don't think I'm only kind of as much, uh, a lot of law enforcement are very reluctant to sign um, those certificates saying that the person has cooperated. And it's a, just a little one page certificate, but I think because of the climate of immigration throughout the country, um, I think people bring their own biases in terms of, I don't want to help you know, this immigrant person moved towards citizenship. And so that has been a really tough issue we've been dealing with. Did you have a question? Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't require conviction of the person that was being prosecuted, does it? No, not a conviction, just cooperation. And that's what I've been telling the DAs across the state. Just cooperation. I think some people have interpreted it as though if they don't get a conviction, then they will not sign the, the certificate. Um, and that's extremely unfortunate. Most recently, and the reason I came on board, um, the whole is issue of trafficking is really big now. And the FBI is all involved with the trafficking issue, and they actually came to legal aid and said, we need some assistance. I mean, all throughout the state, there are a lot of, um, you guys probably read about here where they go in and they raid brothels, so to speak. I can assure you some of these brothels that they're reporting are filled with people who are victims of trafficking. And they know that. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Um, the law enforcement agencies that are good with that. They, they are becoming more aware and informed about trafficking and will sometimes contact our agency so we can intervene um, before the, the people are taken into immigration custody. Um, so does anyone have any questions on the whole battered immigrant issue or how to access our services? Um, because I do have a handout. We do have one intake specialist. She is in the Wilmington office. She is our portal for intake throughout the state. Um, so if you had, if you guys were dealing with any issues regarding immigration, especially if domestic violence is involved, I would suggest that you at least call the BIP so we can assess the case. It's really unfortunate when we run into situations that's a little bit too late and someone's telling us about a case. We're like, gee, you know, that would have been a perfect case for us to assist the person 
uh, you know, towards moving for citizenship. Um, because without that, without work authorization, um, you have this, you know, poor immigrant victim that's really just kind of floating out here without be, being able to access many of the services. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you for allowing us to come out and speak.